My new book, Deadly Games, is out on Kindle and print on demand. I'm quite proud of this one. It's twice the length of the previous two books. So now it's actually complete novel length and not just a tiny novella. And it's like a multi-character plot where the character are trapped in a, in a deadly maze where they have to fight and survive for the amusement of the decadent social elite of the Empire. So if you like sword and sorcery or want to support my channel, check out my new book, link in the description below. Let's get to today's topic. By my internal count, this is my 111th video. I know my internal count is wrong, but still, I thought this would be a great opportunity to talk about the Lord of the Rings. What hasn't been said about the Lord of the Rings, which can be said? And I can too. I mean, there have been like uh, scientific studies on the book, uh, many different adaptations and everything, so, and you can find great stuff online, book form, everywhere, really. It is uh, an all-time classic. One of the foundations, the foundations of classic epic fantasy. So, what I want to talk about is what The Lord of the Rings means for me until the new version of the One Ring role-playing game comes out and then I'll give you a detailed review of, of what I find there. So, coffee, Lord of the Rings, my Lord of the Rings shirt on. My first encounter with Lord of the Rings was the old animated movie, which I probably watched on TV when I was like five because I can't really remember a lot of it, but I still remember that I was afraid of Gollum and the Ring Wraith. So afraid that I really disliked the movie. I really disliked that. And I remember we uh, had that recorded from TV onto VHS tape. And at some point I uh, like changed the label on it from Lord of the Rings to something else and hit it in the back of the cabinet so that I wouldn't have to watch it again. Really I really dislike that movie. But uh, when I got older and got into fantasy and role-playing, Lord of the Rings was a constant reference. Something where a lot of the other gamers and the authors got their ideas from. Really, the classic fantasy elves and dwarves and halflings, all straight out of Lord of the Rings. Finally, in the 2000s, the movie trilogy came along. And I remember, like, a year before The Fellowship of the Ring hit cinemas, I wanted to read the books, finally read the books, so uh, I would actually know something about Lord of the Rings, and not just hearsay. And because I knew that the first chapter, like the About Hobbits chapter, is really boring, I instead read The Hobbit first to, to have some background information uh, and the story before The Lord of the Rings. And Hobbit's a pretty solid read for like a young adult novel, maybe even a children's novel. It's not that frightening or anything. It's a neat little story. And having that, having read that, I took uh, the very old and almost falling apart first German translation my father had of Lord of the Rings and read that front to back and was pretty impressed by the book, I have to say. Well, sure, from a uh, storytelling perspective, 
there is something to be desired, especially pacing wise. But from a world building perspective, it's, it's fantastic. Middle Earth is just so detailed, so much history. It almost feels like a real place. And I love that in fiction. If when I read a story, I have the feeling that there could be a world, that there is a world outside of the story I'm experiencing. And there's so much more going on. There's so much more adventure to be had around that. I really love that. And the movies came along and I remember, still remember watching the first one in cinema. That was a real cinema going experience. I remember that scene when Gandalf is telling Bilbo to, uh, to give up the ring and he's telling him, I'm not a conjurer of cheap tricks. And like the background darkens, making Gandalf more bright in, in the foreground. And that time in the cinema with the big screen, I had the distinct impression that Gandalf was growing to superhuman size that moment. Towering over Bilbo even more than he was as a human. And re-watching that scene later on DVD, it just doesn't have the same impact. It's just the background darkening, but there's no morphing going on. And overall, really, really strong movie. M music is classic, special effects still hold up to this day. Like in costumes and backgrounds are some of the best ever put on screen. I got the DVD as soon as it was out and I've watched that several times. I remember back then I wouldn't watch the whole movie. I just watched the scenes that I really liked. So I would like... So I would go um, Mines of Minas Tirith, fight against the orcs, skip, fight against the orcs at the end, just watch the fight scenes. And then of course the two towers came along with the Great Siege of Helm's Deep. And I must have watched that a hundred times. I remember back then, me and my friends were playing the Dark Eye 4th edition. And I was playing an elf. I think I was playing that elf before watching Lord of the Rings. Somehow, uh, when I started playing the Dark Eye 3rd edition, making my first character uh, the others were like yeah we've got a warrior and a mage we could really use someone like a ranger who knows wilderness and can use a bow i was like oh we could play something like a hunter my friend like here look at the elf the elf can do everything a hunter can do but he can also cast spells i was like okay so i played an elf and in that later fourth edition game I revived that elf and made a fourth edition version elf warrior. I still remember when I uh, got the the sorcery and witchcraft box for fourth edition, where you actually had options to build spellcasting characters. Had many options. Uh, I created that character reading the rules in parallel and it took me a whole day it took hours and hours fourth edition is a really complex and complicated system but it gives you a lot of options to build your character so i might an elven fighter uh, and at first level couldn't fight all that well i still remember i uh, was attacked by some lowly bandit and I cast a blindness spell on him so he was standing in front of me fumbling around unable to see me and I tried hitting him and for like three rounds I was fumbling around in front of that bandit and couldn't hit him because I was such a bad fighter but that campaign we played uh, 
the main plot was that we were following an evil priest of the nameless god because he had plans to destroy the world so he was just evil or something i don't quite remember but we were following him and he would set ambushes and traps for us we would just fall into those time and time again and be forced into combat so after a few levels that elf became super broken strong fighting machine I would use like a haste spell so i had more attacks and could reload my bow fast and then i go zack 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 and just pin cushion the enemies and instead of fumbling around for three rounds in front of an enemy i could one shot almost anything uh really broken at that point but with a campaign where you're always fighting and getting into ambushes all you're putting your skill points is fighting abilities so i don't think it was my fault it was like uh it was a product of his environment it was fun playing that character that elf i tried to bring this strange elven perspective into it of someone who has a lifespan much larger than a human's and a total different outlook and life and human struggle I remember one instance very early in the campaign and we've got like a, a noble knight a dwarven druid and my fighting elf in the party and we are going over a hill and we are spotting a herd of cattle and that herd is uh, going on a stampede i don't remember why but somewhere in that herd like on a tree is a little boy a little farmer's boy who had been watching over the cattle and he is in danger of being trampled to death and the knight in the party is like we have to go and help him and me and the dwarven druid are going well it's just the course of nature we don't have to interfere <laughs> the knight was speechless the knight charged in anyhow to uh, to save the boy so me and the druid charged after him and i was like jumping over the back of the cows and uh, get to the boy and get them out of there well that was a memorable scene another one was where i managed to pull off that shield surfing trick from legolas in the helm's deep uh, siege we were fighting in some dungeon and there were like 20 small poisonous spiders attacking us and we didn't really have any fireball spells or something that could effectively defeat a large number of small enemies I only had arrows and a sword and just hacking away at that didn't seem really practical to me so I uh, grabbed one of the shields from the skeletons that were lying around there then threw it in front of me and jumped on it and skated through those spiders critical success so my DM let me kill d20 spiders with that move and I killed 20 that was legendary I also think that is the last elf I've ever played after that uh, this whole Legolas pretty boy image this tree hugging stuff that elves have really I really didn't fancy that anymore uh, so first watching Lord of the Rings I thought Legolas is super great awesome then later I thought here Gimli the dwarf that's fucking awesome then later <laughs> later it would be uh, Boromir sword and shield is awesome but nowadays uh, that I've grown a bit older maybe more mature I think Aragorn is probably the best character in the lord of the rings or maybe samwise gamshi it's close second aragorn's arc of 
being a reluctant hero and especially reluctant to take up the crown, reluctant to claim his birthright, reluctant to reforge the sword and take up that responsibility. And then finally do that and do all of that well. That's a pretty strong character arc. He's not the greatest fighter in, uh, in the band that is either Gimli or maybe Legolas. He's not the best at close combat, not the best at ranged combat, but he can do a bit of everything. But what he really can do is know what to do and when to do it and take charge of a situation and then stick with his decisions and see them through to the end. Even if it is leading the charge against an overwhelming number of orcs and just go like, yeah, I'm charging this and he charges in there and the others, they charge after him, even though from a, even though he has to know they are charging into a certain death, but he's doing it anything. He's doing it anyhow because it's the right thing to do. Yeah, that's that's a great example of uh, a party leader. Great example of a ranger. Samwise, close second. I mean, Frodo is carrying the burden. <laughs> of the ring, but Samwise is carrying Frodo literally at the end. This unconditional friendship, this can-do, never-give-up attitude, and then Samwise is not wise or powerful or anything, none of the hobbits are, but Samwise just a gardener, but he's doing all of that stuff anyhow. Because he knows it's the right thing to do. Never gives up, never gives in. Best friend a hobbit could ask for. That, that's got to be... That's got to be... Uh, that is an example to live up to, isn't it? Great example for everyone. So, nowadays, uh, it's been a while since I've last read the books. It's been a while since I've last read the, uh, since I've last seen the movies. And I, I get the feeling, at least in, in the games I'm playing, we are moving away from this classic fantasy with elves and dwarves and men uh, to more weird stuff. I get the feeling, especially in Dungeons and Dragons, they're going from some of the Essentials kit, where you only got the base races, men, elves, dwarves, halflings, and only the, the base classes too. Fighter, rogue, cleric, wizard, bard. And we are, war we are going to something more out there, more weird. I get the feeling every party nowadays is tiefling, UNT pure blood, tango, um, some frogman and something. And it's becoming uh, more of a, a zoo of characters than a party. And the adventures go from Middle Earth to, uh, to a weird LSD version of Middle Earth or so straight to hell. <laughs> it's really. This isn't a bad thing, I think, but this classic core, this classic fantasy core is something precious, something we should keep in mind, keep alive, something we should be building on rather than overcome it. Keep in mind what makes a great story, what makes a great hero. That no matter how strange the characters get, it's always somehow about human experience. These 
elves, these dwarves, these halflings, they are all different versions of humans after all. Are they greedy and industrious miners, humans? Are they old and wise humans that are still somehow uh, youthful? Are they small folk just worrying about everyday life and what food they're having for dinner? That's something you should keep in mind when making a character that is out there. It's giving you a new perspective on humanity, on yourself. So when I'm playing a character that is a, a clockwork monstrosity, uh, an artificial human, a uh, what's it called, a war forged. What I want there is actually to have a curious character, a bit like Data from The Next Generation, who's got a different outlook on humanity and who's trying to learn and to understand what it means to be alive and what it means to be a human, a person. So my campaigns have been getting quite out there. But lately I've been returning a bit to my roots. We are playing the Dark Eye again. <laughs> the Dark Eye one point dark with the uh, hacked to unrecognizable rules that I use. And the Forbidden Lands, which is like uh, that uncle of Lord of the Rings you're not talking about. It brings a lot of uh, dark humor into a classic fantasy setting, which I love. But I'm also looking forward to the new edition of The One Ring and see what is to find in there. And, run a, and then run a, a very classical game of Lord of the Rings. So that, that's all I've got for today, so let me give that question back to you, the audience. What does the Lord of the Ring mean to you? What is your favorite character? Let me know in the comments below. Thanks for watching and goodbye.